welcome to the Foolproof Theology Podcast, where I like to talk about theological issues from history that are strong and well-aged. I'm your host, Chase Davis, and today I'm really excited about our guest, Dr. Ryan Tafalowski. Before we hear from him, uh, I wanted to thank a listener. We had a listener give uh, send me a bottle of bourbon cask strength, so they picked up on the theme of the uh, of the podcast. I'm not going to be consuming this right now because as of recording this, it's 11 a.m., uh, but I just wanted to thank my friend from Texas that sent me uh, this bourbon, and I, I look forward to enjoying that on a future episode with a guest. Um, but on the podcast today, we have Ryan Tafalowski. Ryan serves as the associate pastor of Foothills Fellowship Church in Littleton and an instructor in the Division of Christian Thought at Denver Seminary. Ryan is married to Adrian and has a 17-month-old um, at home. And uh, Ryan, thank you so much for being on the show today. Oh, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, maybe someone will send me a bottle of bourbon for my appearance. I'm just yeah, they should. Yes. They should. I think one of my goals is to get to the point where I can send every guest in advance a bottle of the same bourbon I have. So it can yeah. be like we're sharing a drink. Oh, no, uh, they're in person. Yeah, an aspiration. Yeah. Well, uh, part of the way I like to kind of lead off on episodes is hearing a bit of people's stories and backgrounds. And, um, you know, there's there's a lot of content that I, I'm really looking forward to discussing with you on uh, Weimar Germany and other things. But um, one of the things that I always like to kind of inquire is what what led you to kind of study uh, and spend years of your life dedicating to Paul? And I'd ask for the pronunciation, Paul Althaus, Althaus, right? Yeah, Althaus. Mm -hmm. um, is, and your dissertation was on Paul Althaus, is that correct? Yeah, I, look, I sort of looked at a constellation of Lutheran theologians uh, at the beginning of the 20th century known as the Erlangen School, and I looked at him in particular. Uh, he's not a very famous theologian, especially compared to all the other people in the 20th century. He's sort of a lesser light behind the Bruner, Bart, uh, Bart uh, Boltmann types, the killer bees. Yeah. For sure. Oh, I didn't know they were called that. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, what led you to kind of choose him and that topic particularly? Was there something in your story that you're like, I really want to do this? Did it just seem like a, a topic at the time? What led you to be curious about this? Oh, well, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, the short answer is, well, okay. So like any self-respecting evangelical with any intellectual interest, I moved from Josh McDowell uh, to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who's kind of the first uh, modern sort of mainline Protestant theologian evangelicals tend to read. And when mm -hmm. I read Bonhoeffer for the first time, I think I read The Cost of Discipleship, and I was just infatuated with it. There was this vision of uh, discipleship in a sort of secularizing world that I found so compelling, and there's a richness. Um, uh, and a sort of a Bonhoeffer is an evangelical theologian in the, in the purest and best sense of that word. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I got really excited in my early 20s about Bonhoeffer, uh, and that led me into reading folks like uh, Karl Barth, who we've mentioned, and uh, some other sort of er yeah, early 20th century theologians. And so I thought, oh, this is great. You know, I'm going to write a PhD on Bonhoeffer. And then I started to reach out at programs, and it turned out that I was going to write a PhD on Bonhoeffer along with every other person who's ever existed, right? right. And so <laughs> uh, when I sent in my proposals to schools, uh, people were like, well, yeah, I mean, you could write another PhD on Bonhoeffer, I guess. Um, but part of the difficulty is when you do a PhD, uh, the, the fancy language they use is you have to make an original contribution to learning. And I just didn't right. think I had anything new or interesting to say about Bonhoeffer. I mean, there's so much good scholarship on him. So one uh, scholar that I ended up working with in Edinburgh suggested, well, have you looked at theologians sort of on the other side of the German church struggle? Mm. Um and I hadn't really. And she, so she said, go read Robert Erickson's book, Theologians Under Hitler, um, which has a really daunting cover, right? There's like a swastika. It's over yeah. a cross. It's on this like black cover. So um, <laughs> it's a very angsty book to be seen reading. And uh, <laughs> yeah, you don't take that to a coffee shop and get a yes. lot of good looks. <laughs> That's right. Who's that guy at Corvus reading that Nazi book? Uh, <laughs> so yeah. Um, I would just, there was a whole other side of the Ger German church struggle, which I just didn't know anything about, um, partially because almost none of it has been translated. So that was really daunting. So I meant doing all the research in German. And mm. uh, there's no good reason that I chose Althaus, except I could get my hands on a lot of his sources. It turned out to have been an interesting project, but there's an alternate reality in which he's just sort of boring and 
he's not well known for a reason, but he's a pretty interesting guy. So that's how I ended up there. That's hilarious. I'm, I'm assuming you had to learn, learn German if you didn't already know it to get into the primary sources there. Yeah. So, um, Althaus is very well known as a Luther interpreter. He's got two very important books on Luther that are uh, widely in print in English. But aside from that, uh, virtually none of the sources had been translated. And I, I was dealing with a lot of archival material too. So um, I was, yeah, reading German all the time. I'm still not very good at speaking it, uh, but I can, sure. I can get along reading it. Yeah. Man, that sounds uh, sounds intense. It kind of sounds like the typical academic experience where you're locked in a library with some old documents and you're translating primary sources and uh, just hoping to make sense of them. Yeah, you know, I uh, I was able uh, through some, some very gracious help from some scholars in Germany to access and spend a week in Althaus's archive. All of his documents were left at the university there and i was holding letters from dietrich bonhoeffer written in bonhoeffer's own hand and carl bart and bruner boltmann so that was, it was pretty wild that's amazing that's so cool yeah, um, really fun. i read i read a couple of uh kind of the brief articles you sent me that summarized uh some of your work um one of the quotes that stood out to me um was that Alt althaus has been called has been referred to as the most evil german theologian in the na national socialist era um wow. and i was like oh boy um so what do you, what do you make of that what what why would somebody make that declaration about him uh yeah if i'm not mistaken i think it's from the the british historian uh richard gutteridge uh who's written a lot on holocaust history um the reason Gutteridge says this is that um, Altaus should have known better, perhaps. Uh, he's uh, quite a moderate person, Altaus, politically and theologically. He's very much a centrist. Um, and I guess what Gutteridge means is that um, the reason that Althaus is so evil in his judgment is that he lent a sort of a veneer of respectability to National Socialism because he was such a widely respected figure. He was a really influential churchman, uh, and he was not thought of as a radical. I mean, compared to someone like, I, I don't know, Heidegger, for instance, who joined the party early on and stayed a Nazi till the bitter end and was repentant, um, uh, unrepentant uh even afterward rather mm. altaus never joined the party he be, he was very critical of nazism starting in the, in the late 1930s but by then it was sort of too late and some people think there are a lot of people who gave national socialism a chance that wouldn't have if not for altaus so that's i think is sort of what's meant there i think it really overstates the claim i don't think it's fair to altaus um but that's what scholars do they overstate the claim Right. Unfortunately, we, we all can do that. What what makes you think that it's uh, unfair? What in your research made it seem like that's an unfair statement to make? Yeah, a couple things. The way that I read Altos is that he was a moderate thinker with a sort of conservative disposition who was really concerned about the direction that Germany was taking under the Weimar Republic. Mm -hmm. Uh there are documents, personal correspondence mainly, that shows that Altas was not particularly thrilled about Hitler uh, early on, um, but he considered him, um, yeah, much better than the alternative, which was a really sort of liberal and what he saw as a, a godless democracy under Weimar. Hmm. So, um, and, you know, he's got a lot of experiences that are hard for us to understand. I mean, he was a military chaplain during the First World War on the Eastern Front. Uh, he worked at a military hospital in Poland where he was dealing with disabled uh, German veterans. So he's got this real strong kind of uh, patriotic streak that a lot of these theologians had uh, and miscalculated badly. Um, and the other reason I say this is that Altas also spent a good deal of his career sort of being censored by the Gestapo um, because he was very critical of the Nazi positions on euthanasia. Uh, mm. And so in the early 1930s, 34, 35, 36, the Nazis pass all these laws, sterilization laws, where they're um, forcibly sterilizing uh, what, what they call lives unworthy of life. That's the language they used. Um, wow. Altaus was very critical of this. He wrote an essay against euthanasia that got him in a lot of trouble. Actually, the Gestapo almost arrested him, the rector of his university, 
uh, intervened at the last second to save his job. But we have record um, of him preaching sermons uh, with the Gestapo sitting there to make sure he doesn't say anything out of line. So he's a complicated figure. Yeah, yeah I, I, uh, I have to I have confess, to I've been a little, a little uh, scared, scared when I preach sometimes, but I've never been scared enough to where I've had <laughs> Gestapo uh, in the pews, uh, yeah. at least to my knowledge. You know, that's, that's, right. uh, that's intense, man. Yeah. Uh, that kind of gets us into kind of the uh, Weimar, Weimar Germany uh, context. Um, you know, I, I've read several articles over the last uh, five years or so. Um, some people would speculate that this is uh, another thing, and, and it seems really popular um, to talk about fascism, uh, especially on the right, um, yeah. nowadays, just because, um, I don't know, I guess people, the, the cultural history we have with world war II and kind of the legacy of mm -hmm. that great, uh, obvious evil, um, yeah. that, that, uh, world war II engaged with, I think people are looking for a cause or, or something like that. And so I've seen articles written that that compare do a compare comparison to Weimar Germany. And then some some other people are like, no, I mean, like, uh, we understand why you're saying that. But but please don't please don't do that. That that is a uh, that is doing way giving way too much credit to what's going on now, because what was going on then was so unique. Um, as someone who has kind of studied the context that Outhouse was in, mm -hmm. um, what was that context like? What was Weimar Germany like? Uh, well, a couple things to say here. Really disorienting time. Um, the Weimar Republic only lasted about 12 years. Uh, okay. uh, 14, I guess. 1919 to 1933. Uh, before that, Germany, well, Germany had only become a nation in 1871. So one of the reasons that the comparisons to America break down a little bit is that America has been a lot, uh, has much more enduring and I think more durable democratic institutions than the Weimar Republic had. Uh, right. They had been a monarchy uh, since the 19th century um, until the end of the First World War, uh, where under the terms of the, uh, the Versailles Treaty, they became a republic. Uh, many sort of old guard conservative theologians like Altas, and he's not alone here by any stretch, were really suspicious of this um, for a few reasons. One, uh, they're all Lutherans, which means that they've got a very conservative political theology. They're dealing with the sort of two kingdoms doctrine where a hierarchical authority is instituted by God and you are uh, to, to owe a debt of honor to the government, even if you don't necessarily like it. Now, what's a, a little bit ironic is they were happy about that doctrine uh, under, say, Bismarck, didn't like it so much uh, under a prime minister in a democracy. Right. So we can all be inconsistent <laughs> in the way that we apply our theology. Um, right. But they thought that uh, really Altas had a profound sense that the divine order of things had been disrupted by Weimar. Uh, he, he thought that uh, Republican style representative government was inconsistent with the German spirit. Uh, and mm -hmm. we can talk about that later. I mean, that's a key to his theology. He, he thinks that each ethnic group has a sort of spiritual sensibility about them. Fascinating. Um, yeah, yeah, it's some wild stuff. Uh, and uh, I will say this. There are some parallels between Weimar and what we're experiencing now in the sense that it was a really um, a tumultuous time. Sexual mores changed really dramatically. Um, mm. Weimar Berlin, for instance, had a... Uh, a really thriving uh, gay and lesbian scene, which a lot of conservative theologians found very disruptive. Uh, there's a scholar by the name of Mel Gordon who's re written a book about uh, Weimar Germany called Voluptuous Panic. <laughs> and I love that wow. title. And it actually captures the spirit of what was going on quite well. Um, it was a, uh, a time of pretty dramatic secularization. Uh, sort of Lutheranism had been the dominant culture of Germany for a long, long time since the 16th century, particularly in Northern Germany. And uh, you got the influx of alternative worldviews in the 20s. Marxism makes an appearance in Weimar Germany as a, as a serious public option. All of this combines to sort of create a very unstable government, which helps to uh, 
explain the appeal of Hitler uh, in particular, because he is promising a return to Germany's Christian roots. He's uh, promising a return to law and order. He's um, promising a return to conservative and traditional gender roles, sexual ethics, things like this. So, wow. It's a wild I have time to time. ask on, on that, that topic, topic what, what do you, do you wish, wish for someone like Paul Altos? How could he have better responded to um, what would have obviously been concerning uh, for for mm-hmm. someone like him? Um, it seemed he went this. This is a thing I feel that it seems like there's a lot of I, I refer to as illiberalism, mm-hmm. um, meaning yep. like there's a, a lot of kind of push for cancel culture or other things. Mm-hmm. And it's tempting in the face of illiberalism to rise up with another illiberalism to yeah. match the power, which seems to be what. Uh, Altos unfortunately got himself involved with. Mm-hmm. What do you think could have been a better course of action? Uh, that's a really difficult question. It's a good one. Uh, I would say this sort of faithful Christian presence in the public square, I think, needs to be persuasive, not compulsive. Um, part of the reason, uh, and, and Altos says this in a sermon that he preaches in 1945, right as the war is ending. He says, listen, we were really concerned about the, the direction of our country. We're still concerned. And he says that we thought we were welcoming the voice of God, but we were opening the door for the devil. It's a very haunting image he gives. Mm. Um, and in an essay in 1933, Altos does, he directly calls Adolf Hitler a gift and miracle of God. That's the language he uses. So a couple things I would say, uh, the Christian faith, I think, maintains its power by persuading, not compelling. So I think one of the things that Altos wanted to do was say, how do we get uh, this Christian project, uh, which he understood the German nation to be since the time of Martin Luther was a Christian project, how do we get it back on track? Well, we get a, a, a ruler in there who will just uh, decree all these things by fiat, right? Uh, But I think we're running into this in our culture at the moment too. Uh, I don't think the weapons of legislation are especially helpful against the trend of secularization. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's one lesson I I think we can learn from Althaus is that if we cannot persuade people by the beauty and the power of the gospel, we can't compel them with Christian legislation, I think. Yeah. Uh, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I agree with, I mean, like that's a really uh, succinct way to put attention that I've been feeling as well, because we know that all legislation is moral. Uh, It comes from some kind of moral underpinning, Mm -hmm. but yeah, if we can't persuade people the, uh, to, to uh, turn towards a more beautiful vision of what society could be, the answer isn't to them silence or somehow, uh, you know, legislate them into silence. That would be a, unwise way to move forward yeah and it doesn't work uh it didn't work for germany i doubt it would work here uh uh, reinhold niebuhr who's writing about the same time but from america has a good essay on this about prohibition right we we, prohibition didn't work because it didn't compel people through a moral vision uh it just forced them through legislation and people found all kinds of ways to circumvent it right so Hmm. Uh, another lesson I think you would draw, and this is where Bart's critique of Althaus is important, is that we ought to be really careful about interpreting political events theologically, um, because we just can't be sure where they will go. Right? Um, it's not especially fair to to sort of crucify Althaus for for being wrong about Hitler in 1933. Lots of people were. And in 1933, Hitler wasn't saying like, hey, my first plan is to round up a bunch of people and commit mass genocide. Although uh, there were signs of it for those who had ears to hear. Um, Lots of people were wrong. And I think um, there is a temptation to be so single-mindedly focused on what we want for our society that we will overlook a great deal. I think that's mm. another lesson from Altas. Yeah, that's we a will, great word. We'll compromise some of our principles. Yeah, that's uh that's super encouraging. I, I would yeah, I, I'm gonna need to think about that a lot. <laughs> I think that's that both of those would be uh very wise and prudent considerations as far as 
uh, you know, how much we align ourselves and, and who we align ourselves with um, left, right, whatever, wherever people land. Um, yeah. I think that's really important. Um, you mentioned uh, the big three B's or uh, Bonhoeffer, Bart, Bruner. Um, but there were so many others, right? Um, yeah. Bolt yeah. yeah. It, so there was disagreement about how to engage politically. Bonhoeffer's approach was different. How? How is Bonhoeffer's approach to that situation they were in different? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, Bonhoeffer is half a generation behind those other guys. I think that's okay. a big reason. Uh, Bart and Althaus were born in the same year. Uh, Boltmann was the same generation. Bruner too. Uh, Bart and Bruner are Swiss. That's a big part of it. Also, um, they are not okay. German, even though they're German speaking. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of it has to be to, to do with their unique life experiences. I mean, as I mentioned, Altas joined the military when he was 18. Uh, he was disqualified from conventional service for some health reasons. So he ended up being a chaplain. Uh, and he saw Germans. Uh, yeah, he saw Germans being mistreated by Russian nationals in Poland. So that was a galvanizing experience for him. He was raised in a very small town in a very bucolic setting in Germany. Uh, and much like in the United States, uh, political attitudes tended to uh, shift quite a bit, depending on whether you live in a rural setting or an urban setting. Bonhoeffer was raised in Berlin to a very cosmopolitan family. Uh, and so uh, Bonhoeffer also wasn't raised uh, as a Christian in the same way that Altas was. He was raised in a Christian family, but his parents were not really practicing uh, he had Jewish family members too. Um, but what's interesting is Bonhoeffer's views don't change till a little bit later in his life. As a student in Tübingen, he joins a fraternity that is very nationalistic, anti-Semitic. He was raised in that. Um, and even the early, early Bonhoeffer, like lectures he gives in the 20s, uh, are a little bit militaristic. I mean, he gives some lectures when he's living and serving a German-speaking community in Barcelona, for instance, in the, in the late 20s. He gives a series of lectures on where he essentially says God has given Germans the right to conquer other people to pursue their vocation in the world. So early Bonhoeffer can be a little bit authoritarian. And even uh, in 1933, when the Aryan paragraph was passed, this was legislation that allowed churches to prevent pastors who had any uh, Ar non-Aryan ancestry to disqualify from them from service. Bonhoeffer initially at the very beginning says well the state is sort of justified in doing this he changes his mind later um partially i think because his experiences are different i mean bonhoeffer studied in america uh whereas altaus never left germany i mean he had a very sort of um oh what's the word for it a sort of just an insular experience compared to bonhoeffer uh, bonhoeffer met uh, very very famously uh, had a sort of transformational experience at antioch baptist church in harlem worshiping with black Christians. Uh, what's interesting is they, they're sharing the same Lutheran framework uh, and they interpret the doctrine of the two kingdoms very, very differently. And I think there's yeah, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. You know, what's interesting about Bonhoeffer to me is that I see Bonhoeffer get used by both. I, if you want to call people conservative or liberal or whatever, but, but kind of two different streams, you've got uh, Eric Metaxas, who uh, famously wrote that, that long, very long, kept me up many nights, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, biography of, um, of Bonhoeffer. But then on the other hand, you've got people on like, more of a left side that go, yes, this is, this is how the, to interpret Bonhoeffer. What do you make of this kind of split, uh, interpretation of Bonhoeffer? Yeah, it's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, a couple of years after the Metaxas biography was published, a, a scholar by the name of Charles Marsh, who teaches at the university of Virginia, wrote a biography that's about the same length uh, called Strange Glory. Uh, and as a matter of principle, he doesn't name Metaxas once uh, okay. in the whole book. Uh, and Metaxas, of course, is a conservative evangelical, both theologically and politically. Marsh is a mainline Protestant, uh, mm -hmm. and they have very different interpretations. Uh, a, a scholar by the name of Stephen Haynes in 2018 wrote a book called The Battle for Bonhoeffer about this phenomenon. And, he's, and he shows all these examples of the sort of liberal Protestant left or even the secular left 
saying we need a Bonhoeffer moment. And then you've got conservative even saying we need a Bonhoeffer moment. Uh, and so what is it? Is Barack Obama Hitler or is George W. Bush Hitler? Right. Right. Uh, yeah. These are incompatible visions. Um, and I think part of the reason Bonhoeffer is used that way is because the shape of his life is so compelling. Uh, he's there's scholarly debate about whether he technically qualifies as a martyr or not. But I think broadly speaking, um, the power of his personal story is so alluring that everybody wants him. Right. Um, right. My take is, and I'm not a Bonhoeffer expert. I've, I've dealt with him quite a lot. I've written some on him. My own personal reading of Bonhoeffer is that he'd probably be confused by the question. Uh, sure. And uh, it would object in the strongest possible terms to be, used both ways i think uh mm. there are lots and lots of things uh that bonhoeffer says that evangelicals could be excited about and there are lots and lots of things that he says that should really scandalize evangelicals he was raised in mainline german liberalism uh i mean that was where he cut his teeth and so uh for instance the way that bonhoeffer talks about the bible might be pretty concerning to evangelicals in some ways um but at the same time, I mean, in his book on ethics, he just says abortion is murder. There's no reason, there's no way to debate it. It's just obvious. And mainline Protestants uh, conveniently leave that part out of their interpretation of Bonhoeffer. So he just resists our categories, I think. That's, I think that's a, a fair way to put it. And it helps me kind of like read uh, people more charitably. Mm. Um you know, we've talked about Bonhoeffer's background and Altos's background and other people's background. One of the things I was curious about, um, particularly with Germany, and we, and this is what you kind of mentioned earlier, there was this kind of uh, ethnic pride. Um, there's kind of two questions I have, and we can answer once we can answer them sequentially or however you want to do it. One question relates to Schleiermacher. Was Schleiermacher a German theologian? Mm -hmm. uh, now, yeah. Would you say that he influenced Althaus as far as his, I mean, Schleiermacher is known, I think at least, as kind of the father of theological liberalism mm -hmm. um, yeah. and trying to pair kind of enlightenment values with uh, biblical interpretation. Um, mm -hmm. did, was that kind of a seedbed for uh, for these these uh, German theologians or, or no? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, so yeah, Schleiermacher is, I think, without question, the most important theologian in the modern period in the German context. Uh, because everyone who comes after him is either uh, echoing him or reacting against him. Uh, I mean, there is a very credible way to read Bart's entire project as a rejection of the Schleiermachian vision. Um, wow. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Uh, a couple things I'll say. Schleiermacher... Uh, becomes the dominant voice of theological liberalism, but in a school of thought that really uh, Althaus was not very sympathetic with. Um, he, he really influences um, Albert Ritchell and then Adolf Harnack in particular. And Harnack's an important character in this story because he's a theological liberal. Uh, Bart trains under Harnack uh, and comes to reject the, the whole project because mm. uh, first of all, he thought it doesn't have any teeth, right? Bonhoeffer, uh, sorry, Bart, his first job out of school was a, a pastor at, in a very small village in Switzerland. And he gets up to preach and he found, he finds that he has, he doesn't know the gospel. He doesn't know what to tell all these people. He's been trained. Nice. He says, uh, I've learned a lot of interesting stuff about the Bible in the ancient Near East, but I can't preach anything. Uh, wow. And that was characteristic of uh, Bruner also, and a, a guy named Edward Ternayasin. These are the founding editors uh, of the journal Between the Times, which is sort of a clarion call against theological liberalism. So you don't see theological liberalism playing much of a part in the confessing church. Uh, Althaus was also critical of it, but one element where Schleiermacher is really influential is his emphasis on experience as a category for theological reflection. Okay. Um, and so... On that score, he's profoundly influential for these figures because Althaus is, is uh, drawing on scripture, yes, the Lutheran confessions, yes, but uh, he is also drawing really, uh, really serious theological conclusions from his experience. Um, there's a, almost a sort of a mysticism about it. 
which I think you can trace all the way back to Schleiermacher. Um, Altus was a scholar in, in what's called the Erlangen school and the Erlangen Lutherans, uh, they called their approach, uh, experience theology is the translation in English. If you were just to render it literally experience theology. So, uh, yeah, Luther, uh, Altus has a very profound sense of his own Germanness as a theological category. And that's a very Schleiermachian impulse, even though Schleiermacher, I, I would be shocked, uh, if you shared Altas's political sympathies, but the methodology is there. Yeah, that's a really interesting observation to make. It's something that uh, kind of overlaps with uh, stuff I'm working on. I've got a book coming out next year on um, triperspectivalism, which is kind of John Frame's theological method. Um, and in triperspectivalism, the idea is that there is objective truth, objective knowledge, but our, our, uh, our approach to that objective knowledge, theological knowledge, is threefold. It's cognitive, affective, and uh, situational. And mm. it it's able, at least in my mind, the proposal I make is that, and I haven't delved into Schleiermacher or anything like this, so I may be totally butchering categories, but at least from uh, experiential theology or today with uh, these kind of uh, lived experience epistemological approaches, mm -hmm. um, I feel like they can be brought in to uh to subjugation to kind of an approach to to knowledge and to theological knowledge in a way that doesn't subvert the authority of scripture that doesn't uh but rather complements how yeah. we read scripture mm -hmm. um so i don't know if that comports at all or, or if it contradicts uh schleiermacher and, and that whole school of thought in terms of their uh their experience theology yeah, that is really interesting. I, the, I was listening to you speak, and congratulations on your book, by the way. That's really exciting. That's Thanks. really cool. Uh, um, there's something really unreflective about Althaus's theological method. I mean, he he doesn't seem to be aware that he has an epistemology. He just sort of thinks this is, you know, like uh, he interprets Luther's small catechism and uh, – just to give you one example, in the Catechism, Luther says, I believe that God created me together with everything that is. That's all Luther says. Okay. Althaus writes like a 30 page essay on that one line in which he says, Oh, well, if God created me, that must mean that he created me uh, German. <laughs> and that must mean that my race is somehow this sort of structural category and that I can draw all kinds of theological implications from it. So there's something sort of. Uh, To my knowledge and to my mind, and and having not read everything Altas ever wrote, I mean, I'll just say that, uh, sure. it doesn't seem to me that he's willing to submit uh, those conclusions to any sort of critical scrutiny, where I think a methodology like what you propose there is really helpful. Um, there's a sense in which he just sort of feels his Germanness to that effective piece um, and just thinks that's very significant theologically, uh, just sort of an intuition. I mean, the word he uses is... Uh, I mean, it's, it's really hard to translate into English. I mean, it, it just sort of means the, the spiritual vitality that every ethnic group has that's unique to its own ethnic group. Um, so I don't, fascinating. Yeah, I don't think that conclusion would have really been possible before Schleiermacher. Uh, not huh. to say that Schleiermacher is responsible, of course, but just to say he opens up a way of thinking about method that wasn't there before. Yeah, and this is also kind of riffing on some of the stuff in here. That's really interesting mainly because I was listening to uh, to an interview between two guys talking about experience and ethnic knowledge, um, which I, I kind of like outright go like, that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. And I would say an embrace of that uh, leads to many conclusions that I think would be not only unhelpful, um, but harmful. Mm -hmm. um, but they were talking, and this kind of gets into our cultural moment, um, about the black experience, the white experience, and different ways that both races approach knowledge, and mm -hmm. um, the black experience is more embodied or more uh, more emotive, and the white experience is more cognitive or intellectual. Uh -huh. um, and and it kind of just reminded me. It's not that I don't really have. I mean, I have a kind of an initial reaction to that, as far as like I just don't find that to be a helpful way mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not. I just 
I don't know about that, but it just reminded me mm-hmm. of kind of some things uh, you were mentioning with that ethnic uh, identity that I guess the German theologians really latched onto. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. I mean, they're writing in a period where sort of race science is being invented as a discipline. Uh, it starts in France, but it also finds its way to England and to Germany and then also to America a little bit later. Uh, and in, in, in particular, a, um, a discipline called phrenology, which uh, advanced the theory anyway that uh, a people's physical characteristics, uh, physiological characteristics, are somehow a representation of their spiritual qualities. Um, this was very, very popular in the 18th century, wow. in the 19th century. Um, so, uh, I mean, I wrote my dissertation on, in particular, how these theologians were thinking about Jews. Yeah. Um, and there's all this science out there showing the pseudoscience we now know, but this was sure. science at the time, uh, that, oh, the reason Jews have long hooked nose is, is because it's a, it's a physical manifestation of the corruption of their spirit, right? Uh, this sort of thing is being wow. said. Uh, it's also being said about Africans, that uh, why is it that they seem to be so big and strong and athletic? Well, Altus draws the conclusion that it must be that they are designed to be a sort of servant class. Uh, they don't seem to have intellectual gifts. They seem to have physical gifts. And so Altus doesn't think we should be cruel to Africans, but he just sort of thinks Germans are going to lead the way intellectually and the Africans can do manual labor. So this is out there. Um, wow. There's some pretty helpful correctives, even at the time. Uh, Bonhoeffer is a good example, but I'll give you another name that's much well less, uh, much less well known. A guy named Hermann Sasse, S A S S E, who is a Lutheran theologian who was on the same faculty as Althaus, actually. And he writes an essay in which he says this idea that there is like a unique spirituality for every people group is preposterous. He says it's not at all supported by the Bible. Um, but he does say Germanness is important or Americanness is important because it is the lens through which you interpret your experience. Right. But there's not some sort of essential spirituality that is different for a German or different for a black person or different for a white person. Uh, right. with, with that said, their experiences vary widely. Um, but I think we ought to be very careful about that sort of racial essentializing. Yeah, I agree. That's really helpful. Thanks for mentioning that. Um, that gives me somewhere to go to kind of like know more about that um, historically. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the other question re- was with regard to, we talked about Schleiermacher, we talked about kind of this, uh, and we, we've we touched on this, but was there a name or a concept for this kind of German idea that like, uh, I, the way we've talked about it so far is like almost like Germans lead the way as a, as if it was like a militaristic, like Rangers lead the way or uh, uh, like, what was that concept in Germany and, and why was it so, uh, so popular? Uh, okay. This is a good question. Um, well, I think it starts in the 19th century uh, when evolutionary accounts of human history are becoming very popular uh okay. and the name here is hegel um hegel has a very high view of the state the german state in particular he has a very high view of protestant christianity lutheran christianity in particular because he sees that those two expressions are the, uh, the highest evolutionary stage of statecraft and religion respectively so um in the across he gives the, the lectures maybe five or six times across the 19th century in different decades But if you go and read something like Hegel's lectures on the philosophy of religion, he essentially argues that uh, religion has been evolving over time uh, and every other religious tradition is uh, an expression of religion on a lower evolutionary stage. Uh, And it is culminated with Protestant Christianity, which culminates with German Lutheranism. So you've got... Um, but he's not the only one. I mean, this sort of evolutionary thinking is beca- is taking root all over the place in America, too. Uh, lots of this thinking undergirds American exceptionalism also. And so the idea here is that um, these places tend to think of Germans and not just Germans, but other Western Europeans, too, just thought of themselves as the pinnacle of civilization. 
uh, oh. and Altos writes an essay where he says, let's just name some names. And he names these incredible poets, these philosophers who have shaped Western civilization, theologians, they're all German. And so on, on that level, it's like kind of hard to argue. Like Germany has just produced an uncommon level of genius. It's, it's really incredible, actually. Um, yeah. What's problematic is the conclusion he draws from it, I think. I think so, too. And there's almost an overlap, uh, kind of two corollary thoughts that I have when you're speaking about this. Um, one is kind of like you mentioned, uh, American exceptionalism, manifest destiny. Um, these things where somehow we're supposed to supposed to be the best, which you see in other cultures, too, like China, uh, mm -hmm. oh, believing they're kind of, you know, everyone goes up to China. Um, you see this in American kind of exceptionalism, but you also see it in almost it's it's as if they're borrowing uh, biblical terms for for that Christians use that we want to be a, a city on a hill or or a light shining before people. And you see this in kind of the Puritan desire to go to a new place to be a uh, a, a place where we can uh, worship God rightly and, and be a, a city that uh, city on a hill. Um, so it's very interesting that these uh, nation states borrow biblical concepts mm -hmm. and use them in a way that that I think all of us would say are are at least problematic, if not outright harmful for uh, for people in general. Yeah, I'll try. I'll, <laughs> I'll try to be delicate here. At at the root of most problematic political theologies I've come across, not just in the German context but in the American context, is uh, a misapplication of the covenant made with Israel. Uh, and this was the case in 20s and 30s Germany, too. Altos doesn't quite go this far. Other theologians start just openly talking about Germany as the new Israel. I mean, there's a profoundly supersessionist theology at work here. Uh, and it's not just the church that has replaced Israel. It is like one particular nation state. Uh, and so some theologians associated with the German Christian movement in Germany were just openly saying, like, the, ta the task that Israel was commissioned with by God, they failed it at the crucifixion, and now Germans are doing it. And so... Um, wow. I wonder if you know the book, The Christian Imagination by Will, uh, Willie James Jennings, who's a, a black theologian at Yale. Uh, okay. He's written in his book that uh, any sort of colonial project, and he goes through a bunch of them, has somehow kind of lifted the narrative of Israel's commissioning and sort of translated it into their context. So um, you're very right to see uh, that these societies are taking biblical images and some of them are just sort of in a very unsophisticated way, just co-opting the narrative of Israel being commissioned to bless all the nations and applying it to their own nation. Right. Yeah. I always, when I was growing up in the church, um, I say that because I, we would never do this. Or I, I, I would never do this leading my church. You'll hear Christians talk about verses in Chronicles. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I think this is really relevant for for our time. Um, yeah, how would you? I mean, like based on what you've studied, I mean, like to be frank, I'm I'm concerned for what I'm seeing in society. I, I've been probably researching too much. I need to take a nap or something um, for what I'm seeing in society and how we're just going about civil discourse, how Christians are going about it. Um, what are what are some takeaways? for Christians, and we kind of already touched on this, what are some takeaways that you could encourage listeners or me um, to, to take kind of Altos's a cautionary tale um, mm. in how we engage in society today, kind of as a, some summary points to what we've talked about? Yeah, good question. All right. So one thing I will say is a good lesson from 20s and 30s Germany, and I, as I sort of have intimated, I wouldn't want to push the analogy too far. Uh, I mean, Americans don't yet know what fascism is in uh, compared to anything that 20th century Europe saw. Um, but I would say this, uh, we should be very careful and very suspicious of and willing to irrigate alarmist rhetoric. Um, Part of the reason that Hitler's appeal to churchmen in particular was so effective is he was able to sort of uh, frame it as a war for the soul of Germany, for the future of civilization uh, that was almost apocalyptic in proportions. This has been happening in American politics for the past 20 years, really. Um, 
if you remember all the way back to Barack Obama's first co campaign, his campaign slogan was simply hope uh, with a portrait of himself, which is a messianic image. Uh, and right. his, his uh, opponent was John McCain uh, and then Mitt Romney. And I believe it was McCain. Or no, I think actually, I could be wrong about this. I think it was Romney. One of his campaign slogans was, let's maintain America as the hope of the earth, which is something that no Christian should ever be saying. Uh, right. <laughs> even if you think America is a great place, and I do in many ways. Right. Um, and now you're seeing it, this election, too, is being billed as sort of an Armageddon showdown and the future of Christian society is at stake. That sort of fear, I think, is unbecoming of Christians. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that Althaus fell victim in the 1930s is because he was afraid that the church would not survive in Germany. Mm -hmm. Um but what's interesting is he was such a great Reformation scholar, <clears throat> and he, forget the, he forgot the famous dictum of Philip Melanchthon, where he says that the church is an anvil that has worn out every hammer, uh, which is a great phrase, right? The church is still here, and the reason the church is still here uh, is because it rests on the promise of Jesus Christ, not on our ability to maintain it. Now, that is not at all to say that there, are, uh, there aren't things that we can do to be growing the church, and we need to be sensitive to our cultural context and articulate the gospel in ways that make sense in this time and in this moment. But at the end of the day, uh, it's the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, that's a big takeaway for me. That's a great takeaway. I think it's super encouraging to me. I'm, I'm, uh, we're preaching through second Timothy at our church and there's a lot of rhetoric in second Timothy from Paul, which I think a lot of Christians would go like, Paul, can't you be a little nicer? Um, and it's tempting for me as I read through it and preach it to, uh, speak out on stuff in, in a way that, um, maybe, reflecting my own captivity of my my kind of own mind um and the way we we deal with uh kind of current apocalyptic rhetoric like you're talking about from from politicians from news from from all sorts of places and mm -hmm. the reality is the church uh has survived over the centuries and it's not because we've had to stand up for ourselves but because we uh, find our hope in jesus christ that he lives today mm -hmm. that he is our king that our allegiance is to him alone mm -hmm. um and can can we get involved in politics? Sure. Can can we celebrate good things? I think I would say great things about our country. Uh, not all rosy by any means, but but at least the American experiment. Can we celebrate those things for sure? But we should be very cautious about becoming captive to either visions of uh, political hope that are um, more uh, left in nature or right in nature. Either way, that promise more then can be delivered. Both both offer almost eschatolog eschatological visions, which they cannot fulfill, which will only be fulfilled in the return of Jesus Christ. And so, um, yeah, that's a great encouragement to me. Um, and I think it's a great encouragement to close out kind of our uh, our conversation, because there's been so much great content that, gosh, I feel like I, I want to go read uh, the books. And that what was that quote again that you mentioned about uh, the church is the anvil? Oh, Philip Melanchthon. Yeah, the church is the anvil that has worn out many hammers. I love that. That's a beautiful picture of, yeah. uh, of hopefully what I can uh, be part of uh, shaping our church to be in the future. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for uh, spending time with me, helping me learn and grow as a pastor theologian. Is there any resource, uh, book, or anything that you want to point people towards? Um, obviously, you preach and teach at your local church and at, uh, at a seminary. Or any other resources we should share with our listeners? Uh, if they're interested in learning kind of more about theology in this period, uh, man, uh, a couple books. Uh, Robert Erickson's book, Theologians Under Hitler, which we mentioned, is a really yep. helpful introduction. And another book that I highly recommend is by a theologian named Jack Forstman. Okay. Uh, it's called Christianity in Dark Times. Okay. And it deals with all of the debates that were happening in the 20th century between all these figures we were talking about. It's really good. Great. I'll have to check those out. Thanks so much for those recommendations. And if you're listening uh, to this podcast and you enjoyed the content you've heard, go ahead and share it with somebody, uh, subscribe to it, uh, rate it. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, you can subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell to keep updated on...